morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Welcome and thank you for joining us uh, for today's webinar. My name is Sarah Darren, and I will be hosting today's webinar. Today's webinar is um, it's a little bit different from some of our previous webinars. What we're going to do is we will be playing a recording of Spiros, Mac of Spiros Macrodocus's keynote presentation from the user conference, the Forecast Pro user conference that we held last month. Spiros did a really great job talking about the past and future of um, forecasting, and we um, really wanted to share some of his forecasting insights with you here today. We will begin our webinar very shortly, but before we uh, start rolling, let's go over a few logistics. Spiros' presentation will run approximately 70 minutes, so a little bit longer than usual, and it actually includes the Q&A session from the user conference. During the presentation, you can submit comments or questions using the um, control panel on your screen um, in the uh, the chat functionality. We'll be monitoring that chat box throughout the presentation and um, we'll respond to any questions via the chat box. Um, also feel free to use that chat box to um, start or participate in any um, discussions that Spiros' presentation may prompt. As usual, um, we will be recording this webinar and we'll email you a link to the video sometime um, next week when it is available. The webinar will also be posted to both for the Forecast Pro website and our YouTube channel, where you can also find a full archive of past webinars. They're free, and it's a great way to catch up on any webinars that you may have missed. It's also worth noting that this webinar is part of a, um, a quarterly series. Um, so while we have not chosen the topic for the next webinar quite yet, um, you should expect to get an email announcing um, the next webinar for sometime at the end of uh, January 2023. We also want to note um, that we will be continuing our business forecasting seminars in 2023. Um, we have not chosen a schedule quite yet, but we are planning on having a class most likely in Q2 sometime of 2023. This is a three-day se seminar and um, it goes in depth into forecasting techniques. Um, so ways to improve your forecasting process and it, um, it, it also uses Forecast Pro to um, demonstrate some of these concepts. Um, it is taught by Eric Stellwagen, our CEO, and myself. A lot of our users have um, really found it very helpful to, uh, to learn um, the, the inner workings of uh, some of these methodologies and also how to implement them um, in Forecast Pro. So this workshop is designed to um, be useful regardless of whether you use Forecast Pro or another forecasting tool, because it really is focusing on the methodology. So one final note before we start Spiros' presentation, if you'd like to learn more about Forecast Pro's software, please reach out to us. Um, Spiros' presentation focuses on forecasting methodology and Forecast Pro's methodology really has been very much founded on Spirits' research and um, the competitions that he'll be discussing in his keynote. Um, in fact, our decision to integrate ML um, into Forecast Pro in the form of extreme gradient boosted trees was a direct result of the fact that this is the technique used by the winner of um, the um, M5 competition, um, again, as Spiros um, will talk about in, in his presentation. Um, so you're not going to see a whole lot of Forecast Pro software in use in the presentation, but know that um, everything that, uh, that Spiros is discussing is really um, part of the foundation of Forecast Pro as well. Um, you can request a uh, um, Forecast Pro demo if you are not already a user through your 
your chat on your control plan panel, or feel free to email us or call, call us. Um, it's also worth noting that you can download a, a, a trial version on our, on our website at forecastpro.com if you are interested. Um, so with that, let's get started with uh, Spiros's um, user conference keynote presentation. Um, because I think in, in our field, in forecasting, um, I think it's, it's not hyperbole to say that uh, we, you, Spiros has been one of the most influential of all of the uh, researchers in the field, and he's really changed the way that businesses have, have done forecasting, and he's changed the course of forecasting research in many ways, and we're very honored to have him as as our keynote. Um, so um, without further ado, I'm going to turn the mic over to Spiros, and he can tell us about the future of forecasting. Good afternoon. Well, I'm going to tell you the academic part of forecasting. I think this morning we heard a lot about the practice of forecasting. And I think uh, Forecast Pro and Eric are pioneers in the blending of forecasting programs, and they are doing a great work. And as a matter of fact, they're the only vendors of forecasting programs that they participate in the M competitions, in practically all the M competitions. And for the SIG competition, they are sponsors. So thank you, Eric. Okay. So what I will do then, and this is the McDuck Open Forecasting Center that we do the M competitions and we do research in forecasting. And what I will talk today is I'll put also the present and the future. So I like to talk then first about the past, that there were the same forecasting methods, what Forecast Pro does with this expert selection. And for a long time, these were the methods that we use in forecasting that was the basis of forecasting and they still are good for a lot of forecasting that they have high, where the, the randomness is high. The present is machine learning. Eric talked a lot before about machine learning. It's the future of forecasting. There are advantages and there are problems. And I'm going to talk about both the advantages and problems. And the future challenges, that's where I'm going to concentrate what we see as the future challenges in forecasting. The first one is what James is going to talk about the override grid. For me, that's a very important part of forecasting since now forecasting becomes automatic and selection of forecasting methods is done by a machine, then we have to concentrate much more on how we're going to override. When patterns change and when relationships change, and they are changing much, much more often than in the past. And then I'm going to talk a good deal about uncertainty and uncertainty is something that we don't like. When you go and talk to business people about uncertainty and you tell them what is the uncertainty in forecast, they get upset and they say, what I'm going to do with it? But we cannot avoid the uncertainty. And the last thing is I'm going to make a distinction between the golden tens, the 10 years, the decade that passed, and the next, the turbulent, turbulent 20s. And we're going to see bigger changes, I think, that what the pandemic brought. Okay, when I talk about forecasting, I would like to make clear something that forecasting has nothing to do with crystal balling. 
people confuse this very often. <laughs> and <laughs> we have to make sure that our audience realizes this. Forecasting works when we identify patterns and relationships, and then they don't change when we forecast. That's something that I think Eric talked this morning. So we predict a continuation of future of past patterns into the future as long as they don't change. That's something very important in terms of forecasting that we tend to forget. If the patterns change, our forecasts are going to be wrong. Very often, people accuse that you cannot forecast well. Well, we cannot forecast if the patterns and the relationships change. Now, if what happens when they change, we have to apply judgmental override. The override agreed that James is going to talk after me. Okay. Now, this is very critical. And I'm going to talk about the mistakes that people make when they do the override. Read. <laughs> the override. And then the last thing is the uncertainty around the forecast. As we said, we cannot ignore it. And we have to consider the risk implications of uncertainty. Okay, so the first thing in terms of forecasting is we collect data, we collect historical data. We like their line data because they are very nice, they are very easy to predict. Even if you ask an artist to extrapolate the series, it's going to do a very good job. Now, this is the forecast in 1980 for 2019 very good forecast okay the patterns did not change the past patterns did not change this is the forecast for the 2020 catastrophic forecast is it a problem of forecasting it's not a problem of forecasting the problem is <laughs> that the past pattern changed and they became actually close to zero in 2020 and again you know we have to make sure that it's no problem of forecasting, that the forecast is not accurate. It's the pattern change, and it's something that we tend to forget, and we have to have it always in mind. Forecast is accurate as long as the patterns don't change and the, rela and the relationships don't change. I have to be <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I will talk about different types of forecasting and different types of uncertainty. I have to be close to here, I think. Okay. Trying to predict uh, a drug, high blood pressure pills. It's easy to forecast. The, part, the demand does not change. As long as you have high blood pressure, you take, you take a pill every day. So the, the uncertainty is very small. And I take blood pressure pills for the last 25 years. I have never gone to a pharmacy and they told me don't have it. Because the cost of storing it it's very small and it does take very much space. So they always have enough pills for everybody to go to take it. Now, if you go to milk, it's a little more complicated in terms of uncertainty because it's fresh milk. So the supermarket has to decide where, how much to store because if they have, it, too much, and then the, the day passed, then they have to throw it away. So the cost then of overstocking is going to be greater than with the blood pressure pills. 
Now, if we go to forecast meat, it's a very different situation because one can choose different types of meat. The price is very important. Promotions are very important. So the uncertainty is greater. And it's a different type of forecasting than high blood pressure pills or milk. Another type of forecasting is high tech items. It's a different type of forecasting. Here, there are different factors that influence demand. For instance, Apple has its own way of forecasting televisions or laptops. Again, they're different. The uncertainty is much greater. Now, if we go to high luxury items like perfume, the demand here is, the big demand is three times a year. Mother's Day, Valentine's Day, and Christmas. The uncertainty becomes greater, and it's not well behaving, and it's a different type of forecasting than the previous ones. High fashion items. They are different every time, so we don't have enough historical data. We have to do different type of forecasting, and the uncertainty is much, much greater. And the last one is demand for high items, for high value items, that they influence a great deal about the level of economic activity. For instance, in the last great re recession, the demand dropped 15%. In the pandemic, it dropped 20%. So the uncertainty here is very different. And the way that you have to de decide how much to produce, you have to wait the risk implications of producing too many cars versus producing too few cars, because it's very expensive to produce too many cars and don't sell. And at the same time, if you produce too few cars, you're going to lose sales. So uncertainty is very different in this versus the previous items. So let me come back a little in time and talk about three milestones in business forecasting. Forecasting started in 1959 with Brown, with Bob Brown, that introduced exponential smoothing methods. From 59 to 2017, they were the only available methods for forecasting. And they were pretty accurate, and they still are used under certain circumstances. <coughs> Before nineteen eighty. And during the, the, the 1980s, the Box Jenkins book and the Box Jenkins method was the critic, the method used most often. And there were three, four factors that they were part of the method. The first one was that the, the method was saying that there is a best model for every time series. The second is that this model was being identified judgmentally. You have to look at the characteristics of a series and find the best model. Then you have to estimate the parameters and make sure that the residuals were random. 
and then if they were random, we had to use it to forecast. Now, all of these things that they used before, we found out later that they were useless because they were doing the difference that they were doing. They were looking this in the terms of the past data, what happens in the past, and they were not looking at the future. And what happened in the first comp the first competition, we found out the statistical sophisticated methods were not more accurate. It was ironic that the more sophisticated the method was, the least accurate it was. Then the other thing we found that the, if you combine more than one method, you were improving accuracy. Again, according to the box method, methodology, it was not correct because for every series, there was a best model. And then the third thing that was a continuation of the second was the uncertainty of the ensemble was smaller than the uncertainty of the individual methods. Now, this thing may seem now today obvious, but this time they were heresy. <laughs> and it's interesting because the statisticians at this time were very upset about these three findings. And when I presented the findings in a conference in the Royal Statistical Society, I heard things un unimaginable that the only reason we found that these results were because we didn't know how to apply forecasting. So, It started slowly and after a lot of efforts, a lot of new studies that we found out that these three findings were correct and the field of forecasting moving to the direction that actually the best methods were simple methods. And the most important thing, it's not how well you fit data in the past, but how well you can forecast the future. Now, one of the things we were told at this time was that the reason we found this result because we didn't use human judgment. So then two competition was one to use human judgment. We got data from four companies and microeconomic data, and we asked five forecasters to forecast. And guess what happened? something that we have found very often since then, that human judgment did not improve forecasting accuracy. Which again seems very strange, but that's what happened in the M2 competition. These were the results. That's where the accuracy of the simple exponential smoothing method it was around 12%. And these were the five forecasters. And the five forecasters were less accurate. Look at the difference. The most accurate was 13.7, and simple exponential smoothing was 11.9. And that's something that we find very often in forecasting, at least on the academic part, that human judgment does not improve accuracy. And this becomes worse when we have, when the forecaster has interest to make, to uh, rather when the biases of the human forecaster enters into the, into the picture. And this goes the accuracy of the box jacket which was again worse than the simple exponential smoothing and the whole exponential smoothing. 
So what Eric said, that the M competitions has changed the field of forecasting. These were the two first M competitions that they did change the way we're thinking about forecasting. The first is that simple model, models are as accurate and more accurate than sophisticated ones. And the second is that human judgment, we have to be very careful how we apply human judgment into the forecasting process. You don't agree with me? I see you thinking a lot. I'm just sucking it all up. <laughs> okay. So that was the M2 competition. The M3 competition by this time, computers becoming, before the first two competitions were done with computers that they were slower than today's calculators. So having a thousand series was a big, big achievement. So by this time in 2000, computers were getting faster. We, have, we could go to 3000 series. That was the, the next step into the M competition. Now we found that a new method, theta, theta, which is a variation of exponential smoothing was accurate, more accurate, but by a small percentage. So we didn't have any big improvements in forecasting accuracy. And the other thing that we're finding in all of the competitions was that they underestimated uncertainty significantly. The forecasts were to a certain extent accurate, but uncertainty was underestimated. A rule of thumb was if you double the uncertainty that the models were giving you, you're getting to some realistic level of uncertainty or measuring uncertainty. Now, the big change came with the fourth M competition, where Slavic Smile introduced a variation, a hybrid method that included exponential smoothing and machine learning. And he developed a model. This hybrid model ended the stagnation that we had in forecasting accuracy from 1959 to 1918 and produced results which were significantly better. Okay. So we went to a hundred thousand series. There was a much bigger sample. Computers were getting by this time much faster. So we could do it. And this ended the long forecasting winter. So we found then a method that was borrowed from findings in image and speech recognition that improved significantly forecasting accuracy. And these were the results. Here is the mean average percentage error. And Slauk's method improved the may by 9.4% over the statistical benchmark. That was a significant improvement. Now here is Forecast Pro, Sharon and Eric. And it, by the way, the only mentor of forecasting programs that has participated in all of the competition is for pro and and it was more accurate 2.2 percent over the statistical benchmark that was a big improvement in terms of vendors of forecasting programs at that time you have to be proud uh, eric okay and 
that was the first time that we found out that the more time, the more computer time you spend, you improve accuracy. Up to this time, the sophistication of the method and how much computer time you spend did not improve accuracy. And we came to the third part of the forecasting history. And what is interesting is that a student, an undergraduate student from a Korean university managed to beat He used a machine learning method, the line gradient boosting machine method, and beat close to 8,000 data scientists in the Kaggle competition that we use. And that's very interesting. And that's what I think Eric was trying to say this morning, that machine me learning methods by themselves can do the work. And it's interesting that somebody who had no any experience in forecasting, being an undergraduate student, managed to beat all of the data scientists that they participate in the competition. And that, us as forecasters, we have to think, what are the implications of this? And as we go more and more of the machine learning, methods or the expert selection is going to do the work that we that forecasters used to do in the past so we have to find new ways to add value to the forecasting process right and these are the challenges So in terms of the M1, M2, M3, and M4, covering practically all the frequencies and domains, the M5 was a hierarchical competition. And there was real data that we got from Walmart. And that's where the machine learning method became the most accurate and the student managed to compete and, and excel. Now, these are the results of the M5 competition over the top statistical benchmarks. On the average, the improvement was 72.6%. So a huge improvement, okay? This improvement became smaller as we're going down the hierarchical levels, so it went closer to three to four okay? percent, but still there was an improvement. But the big improvement came at the top of the hierarchy. And the same thing happened with uncertainty. The improvement again was more than 72% and became smaller at the lower hierarchical levels. And that was based on something like 4,000 products. So the results are statistically significant. So statistical versus ML methods, the implications, the strengths of the, of the ML methods that they discover patterns and relationships on their own. Okay, the same thing was done with the expert selection of forecast pro for statistical methods. But if you think now that the average improvement was 72%, the machine learning methods seem to come a step on top of the statistical methods. And I think that what Forecast Pro has been doing by incorporating machine learning methods, it provides you the greatest possibility to improve forecasting accuracy.
the top 50 submissions of STEM 5 improved forecasting accuracy over the best statistical benchmark by 14%, the top five by 20%, and the winning method by 22.4%. Significant improvements, okay? There are weaknesses. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> it doesn't agree with me, I think. Okay. The problem with, or the difficulties with the machine learning methods, they want a lot of data. And technical expertise to set up the data, to set up the model, and to fine tune the model. It does like me. Now, some other things. The forecast of 52.6% of the more than 7,000 data experts did not, pre uh, did not, it was less accurate than naive one. So half of the Experts, data scientists did not manage to beat naive one. And 64.2% did not, were less accurate than naive, than seasonal naive. That was just taking into account seasonality. Ah, if I'm closer to here, I like it better. Now that's even more interesting that the forecast of 92.5% of the competitors of the data scientists were less accurate than the top statistical benchmark. Still, the simple exponential smoothing methods were more accurate than the majority of the of the competitors in them two competitions, in them five competitions. No, it doesn't like it. There is no pattern, huh? Okay. The changing role of forecaster. ML methods provide considerable average improvement in both accuracy and uncertainty. Identifying the most accurate forecasting model has been gone away from a person, from a forecaster, to some model, to some artificial intelligent algorithm. And there's a lot of work that you can still do for the machine learning methods to improve. Now, the thing is that not all of the data scientists manage to improve forecasting accuracy or uncertainty. And the majority of them did not do better than the statistical exponential smoothing methods. That tells us something that the statistical methods for certain category of prediction are more accurate than machine learning methods. The improvements in accuracy and uncertainty depends on the randomness of the series. They are very high at the top level, they become lower and lower as we go down and uncertainty increases. So there are trade-offs between improved accuracy and uncertainty, and they use the L, the machine learning methods, and there are higher costs of setting up and implementing them. Now the M4 and the M5 competition prove these four things. The first thing 
is that global forecasting model. Global forecasting models do not use every single series that we have, but they use all of the series together to, to develop the model and the model applies to all of the series. I don't know if you do this yet. Not yet. So the biggest improvement then in forecasting accuracy came by using global models, using all of the data. In the case of Walmart, the 4,000 series together to develop a single model that then was supplied to one of the series separately. Okay. So that came the big improvement. The other thing was the idea of using cross validation. I think Eric talked a little about this. Instead of using all of the data, we use part of the data, and then what remains, we use it to forecast, and then we use more data. So we don't use all of the data to develop the model but we use future data to check the validity of the model. And then the improvements depend on how well the series are correlated. The bigger the correlation, the more accurate is the model. Okay. And this light gradient boosting machine that the top student managed to used to beat all of the others has come up to be the best method both in the M5 competition and in several of cattle sales competition. Okay, so let me come now to another part about systematic use of forecasting methods. And as we saw, we have impressive advances, but we have lagging implementation. Only 28% of our survey that we did use systematic forecasting methods. Now this, it was different if you take the size of the company large, medium, small, and micro. But even in large companies, about half of them do not use systematic forecast method. That's not true with you because you are using forecast pro, most of you, I think. But if you take the whole sample of all of the companies, about half of them, even the large companies, do not use systematic forecast methods. Now, part of what we've found out is one improvement in accuracy reduces safety to stops by 2% and improves the level of customer satisfaction. Now, the thing is what happens when you have to use judgmental intervention. These judgmental interventions, and I don't know what James is going to tell you this afternoon, but what research has found out is that very often, instead of improving forecasting accuracy, they reduce forecasting accuracy. So one has to be very careful how you apply the judgmental overrides. But this is the part then that has to do with how we imp implement forecast. And if the patterns do not change, we don't have to do anything. And in this case, we have considerable improvements in the practical part of forecasting. But when we have judgmental overrides, then things become more complicated. And I'm going to talk about when and what type of overrides you, you, should, you should use. Okay, so the judgmental overrides are usually done by a group of people in the company that includes managers, marketing, finance, production. 
and about two thirds of the forecast, of the final forecast, they include overrides. Managers believe that the improved statistical forecast them, and that's true in some cases, but very often they reduce accuracy. And I'm going to show you some examples. In addition, judgmental overrides require a lot of management effort that is very expensive. So we should use them only when they improve accuracy rather than in any time. And there's a very good article, if you, some of you want to look it, that has a lot of suggestions about how to improve judgmental overrides. Maybe we can put it into into for everybody to use if they want. Okay. Some rules of using judgmental overrides. I'm not going to explain them. But there are two things which are very important the direction and the side of judgmental overrides impact their accuracy. And let me explain what I mean by this. This is part of the same study. They had th three companies and two parts of an, two uh, subsidiaries of another company. This is negative adjustments. In other words, when the system forecast, the quantitative forecast is being reduced. In this case, the system forecast Okay, the system forecast was 46.9 and the final adjustment when we're negative became 26.6. And here it was 40.9 and the adjustment, the negative became 28.5. What is interesting here also is to see that the system forecast was higher than the naive forecast in both cases. And here, the naive forecast was 24.5 and the system forecast was 40.9. Now, however, if you go to positive forecast, then from 20, 32.1, almost more than double to 46.9, and there from 29.1 went to 39.6. In other words, positive forecast did not improve accuracy. And what improved accuracy were negative forecast, negative adjustments. So, so basically, you're saying that the over forecasting is obviously higher. I'm not saying that's what this research right. was found. Right. That if you forecast, if you take your system forecast and you adjust it downwards, then you improve accuracy. If you adjust it upwards, you reduce accuracy. Right. So the upper forecasting actually improves accuracy. The adjustment, adjustment. yes. So there are three things that research about overrides has proven. The first one is that small adjustments actually don't do much. You spend a lot of time doing these adjustments and you may improve a little accuracy, but overall you don't improve significantly accuracy while you spend a lot of time in doing these overrides. So don't try to do things which are less than 5% improvements. Okay. The other thing as the table show that positive adjustments 
on the average they deteriorate, deteriorate the forecast and should be avoided because they are driven by optimism. By optimism. This is fine in particular too for large positive adjustments. So people, what you said, they want to be positive. They want their company to do well. They want to over forecast what's going to happen. And the end result was they don't improve accuracy, they reduce accuracy. And what, and the biggest benefits come from large negative adjustments that we may not like them, but these adjustments improve accuracy. Okay. So the best thing then is to do nothing. But if you want to do something useful, you have to concentrate on negative adjustments, things that they're going to be worse than what your statistical or machine learning model tells you. Not very nice thing, right? But that's what research can show. This is what research is on, right? Now, one can argue, is it correct? Is this research correct? But you had, we all understand our need to improve things. Right. And in statistical forecasting and in machine learning forecasting, we talk a lot about biases, human biases, and human biases do not improve accuracy. Okay, now if, at least if you, if, if you think, if your group that you're going to do the overrides suggests a positive adjustment, look at three times more carefully than when there's a negative one. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to come now to uncertainty. So in order then we have a forecast, we have uncertainty, we have to look at the positive outcomes and the negative out, outcomes and then compare them to, to determine what action to take to deal with uncertainty. And let me show you this, which I think is very important, particularly what is happening right now that we're in a period that there is a lot of talk about a recession. And here there are four quadrums and each one of them represents a different kind of uncertainty. And let me talk about each one of them se separately. So this is uncertainty where it's the known knowns. In other words, when patterns and relationships are not going to change, okay. And let's, and let's take a specific example. Let's take Walmart that we did the M5 competition. Walmart has close to 12,000 stores, 200,000 items per store. And they do And they look a very large number of forecasts. They do, I think, 3.4 million billion forecasts a week. Now, why this forecast work? The first thing is they have a lot of customers. So the law of large numbers works. Okay. They have, they have daily data, so the chances of having significant changes in patterns and relationships is very small. The buying decisions of their customers are independent. If they are not independent, like when there's panic buying, then this, the forecasts are not going to be accurate. They take into account external events like food stamp, special occasions, holidays, seasonality, 
they have a very good model that takes into account. And uh, as a matter of fact, now they use the machine learning model that the guy, the student use to win the competition. The customers try to maximize their interest so the wisdom of the crowd supplies. And the forecasts are judgmentally adjusted, they're override for promotions, price changes, the difference demand. Now, what happens if one comes to this quadrant? So here, there are thin tails and measurable. The risks are manageable. For instance, deciding about inventories, how much to store extra to take into account the uncertainty. Now here, the known is that there are recessions, that there are pandemics, that there are things that they happen occasionally. The unknown is, for instance, for the recessions, when the recession is going to start, how long it's going to last, how deep it's going to be. Okay, this is the unknown. What you're going to do now with the next recession, if it's going to start, if it's going to be, how deep it's going to be. This is a very important decision and it's going to affect everybody and it's going to change patterns. So we have to be very careful and I'm going to talk about this, about what is going to happen in the next decade, in the decade that is coming. The forecasting models, however, do not work because patterns and relationships are changing. So some external event calls the continuation of prevailing economic, social, environmental, or other conditions, disturbing ex established equilibria. Known from experience that such events, for example, the recession will occur by being unknown when they will start and what will be their length and depth. The problem now is that people's actions stop being independent because they worry about the negative impact of the event and the wisdom of the crowd stops applying. People now, they act being afraid of the event and the implications of the event. Now, this is the Sun and Pool 500 starting in 1871. And we can see very clearly the known that there are recessions the unknown is we don't know how long they're going to last. For instance, here, it lasted up to here. Some of them are shorter, some of them are deeper. The last one, the Great Recession, that started in 2007 and went up to 2009, it was not so big, but it was very deep. So there are a lot of implications for forecasting. Now, the other one is the unknown knowns. The unknown is human rationality. How far are going to go away from human rationality? The known is that humans are irrational. We're irrational. And we always say the air is human. So, for instance, panic buying will be in this category. The way we overreact in a recession is going to be part of this category. So events are great even by rational reactions to both positive and negative news. I think I like very much what Carl Ecom is saying that some people get rich studying artificial intelligence. He gets rich studying human stupidity. And this is precisely this part here. People 
we overreact to both positive and negative news. Now, stories like this, what they're going to do to, to the next recession, okay? It's going to be a big recession, stock crash in market sell-off. Okay, so the idea then is that all models are based on the, on the assumption of human rationality. We assume by definition that humans are going to be rational. What happens if humans stop being rational? And it happens very often, okay? In particular case, when there's a recession, when there's a story like the toilet buying patterns that they there was a story that there will not be enough toilet paper and then everybody starts buying toilet paper. The unknown is the extent of irrational effect. The known is that irrational behavior is part of human nature. So people overreact to both positive and ne negative news and the wisdom of the crowd is turning into madness of the crowd. Now, this is for me a very interesting example of human overreaction. This is the change in the Dow Jones Industrial Average from the 15th of September to the 1st of October 2008 in the middle of the Great Recession. The two parallel lines is a 99.9% prediction interval. Look how often, 52.7% they're outside of the norm, normal prediction interval. One day, it's minus 7.33. Two days later, three days later, it was another 8% close to. Now, the stock market at this time was about 25 trillions. So 15% of 25 trillions just figure out what happened. And then there are two days that they go up by more than 10%. Overreaction to both good news and negative news. And that's what happens. So uncertainty here, it's not normally distributed. It's far tail, it's not thin tail. Uncertainty during periods of recession, as far tail uncertainty, we cannot measure, we cannot predict what's going to be the extent of this uncertainty. I better start going faster. Okay, and the last part is the unknown, unknown, the black swans. Their uncertainty, we cannot even measure it. Okay. So, there's not very much we can do about uncertainty. Now, the typical uncertainty for the travel industry in the airline industry was in 2020. It was a swan, whatever they want to call it, if it was a white or a black, it doesn't matter. The fact is that the predictions were dismal. And what happens now that you go to the airport and you have to wait hours to be checked or you lose your luggage is because there was an overreaction to, the, to what happened in 2020 that the uh, airline passengers would drop to zero. Okay, the golden tens, and I'm going to take five more minutes. The golden ten was a really nice period. No major epidemics, wars, energy crisis, catastrophic droughts, and all of the other things. And it all started after the 2007-2009 Great Recession. Then things started improving, and for the whole decade of the tens, 
things were in things were golden. The turbulent twenties, it started in January 2001, 2020, with the first confirmed case of COVID. Growing pessimism about the global politics and the economy. This is an interesting story by a guy, I cannot pronounce his name, but he's the CEO and founder of uh, I cannot figure out uh, who are why. And basically he's saying, look, you know, we're going to pass a very difficult decade and we have to concentrate on survival. To what extent we can believe him. But I think there are a lot of signs of being into a very difficult period and maybe the maybe we're going to get away from the COVID in terms of changing patterns and relationships, but we may get into new ones in particular for the recession. Inflation is getting very important. Inflation is getting very high. Only 3% think that there's going to be, 3% of the executive survey think that a recession can be avoided, which now will go back into self-fulfilling prophecies. There are tensions, political tensions. COVID, a lot of deaths war in Ukraine, energy crisis, catastrophic droughts, rising inflation, the stock market, it's still not very at a level of recession, but it's going to come according to many predictions, a major disruption in the supply chain. And I think a lot of you facing this disruption, disruption in semiconductors, disruption in China. The positives in terms of the turbulent twenties, job growth. It's interesting during a coming of a recession to be employment to be such a high level. Rapid progress in AI. AI is going to change a lot of things and how it's going to affect our job as forecasters. This is a picture that won an artist competition. It's amazing that an AI program will paint something like that. That's another program that's called DAL E2. It's interesting, you just type something and it comes up with interesting pictures. The open AI's GPT-3 can be used to write stories, screenplays, marketing brochures. Me crazy. Google's Lambda can make conversations, replacing a lot of people that they uh, they use in centers for answering questions. And GitHub Copilot that can basically help writing computer programs. 
So all of this, and then we have the metaverse, and what will be the implications of the metaverse? Okay, now the challenge for the remaining 20s, there will be a recession, and if yes, when it will start, how long it will last, how deep it will be. If it goes in comparison to 2007, 2009, great recession, it's going to be catastrophic. Some of the predictions say that it's going to be even worse than the 2007, 2009 recession. You remember what happened a few days ago? What will be the impact of AI then in terms of increasing productivity, its effects on white collar jobs? staying clear of its potential risks and the impact of the metaverse on work education and, and retailing okay thank you very much i thought i, I took a little more time thank you Yes. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Great presentation. Uh, my only question is from a practical perspective, what is uncertainty and how would you measure uncertainty? Uncertainty is the prediction interval around the forecast. So it, it can be with, let's say, some probability, like 95%. If the forecast is 100, it's going to be between 120 and 80. So the uncertainty is going to be 40 in this case. Now, we don't like uncertainty, right? We have great difficulties. And what business people say, the uncertainty that we provide as a forecasters is too big to be useful. But that's reality. You cannot play with reality. The, what the model tells the new models now, they give you uncertainty, which is pretty accurate. Okay. And this is something we have to use. And as a matter of fact, they give you uncertainty that it's normal distributed, thin tail. As we saw with the example of the stock market, the uncertainty can be fat tail, can be so big that we cannot even measure it. So when we talk about uncertainty, we have to separate what Nassim Taleb talks about far tail uncertainty and thin tail uncertainty, which is the normal uncertainty, which is the first quadrum, which is the known known where patterns and relationships do not change. Do we have any online queries? Yes. So on the last slide, you, um, you had a bullet point about the risks of AI in particular. What, what do you consider some of those risks of AI and you know, what, what would you be wary <laughs> no, They're of? going to start a nuclear war. For <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, at some point, we can start with science fiction worries, but some of them may become true unless we find some way to restrict what AI can do. Okay. So I think this recession or the impending recession has been like a big talk of the town, right? Everybody's talking about a recession, US recession as well as a global recession, considering how bad things are and how bad things are getting, right? Um, so what is your opinion in terms of a recession or a possible recession? Because generally the, the folk, folks, the advisors, 
is everybody thinks the market is going to go down. It's not going to go down, right? It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? So even if there was not going to be a recession, by everybody talking about the recession, it can start a recession, it can be deeper. I mean, that's, that's the human, that human irrationality, right? That's the problem. Everybody talks about, think about panic buying. Think about when there was no toilet paper to buy. People were storing toilet paper for five years. Why? Because we're irrational. You know, we don't realize at some point the panic is going to pass. It's not real. Maybe we buy for two weeks or a month, but not five for five years. Okay. Thank you. So that concludes um, Spiros's webinar. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed it um, as much as I did. Um, I, I enjoyed it both the first time when I heard it live and again, listening to it now. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning, um, this is part of a quarterly series. So we will be having another webinar in um, January, 2023. And we hope that um, everyone will join us um, in January as well. So have a great day, everybody.